I'm very pleased to be here with two of my favorite authors um, of these fabulous books. Laura Vandenberg and Nina McConaughey. Hey. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for the generous introduction. I'm really happy um, to be here and also to be uh, reading with Nina. Um, I'm going to read from a story in Wolf called The Pitch and I'm just going to read the first like quarter or I can't do math, two thirds of the story. I'll stop abruptly is what I'm, I'm, I'm meaning to say. Um, so here's, here's a little bit of the pitch. In the childhood photo my husband showed me, I noticed something strange. He had found the photo in a wood crate filled with his father's things. We had driven several such crates home with us after the funeral in Lake City two weeks earlier. In the picture, my husband was standing in the woods, shirtless and barefoot and holding a fishing rod. Thirteen years old, slender and pale, a streak of mud on his cheek, one of his father's two big belts knotted around his waist, Americana all the way. My husband's mother, I had been told, died in childbirth. When we first met, he had a nasty habit of leaving his dirty socks on the bathroom floor. And when I'd asked him, were you raised in the woods or what? He had replied, as a matter of fact, I was. The woods in the photo were called the pitch because the tree cover was so dense, not even the fabled Florida sunshine could blunt the shadows. The first time my husband mentioned these woods, reachable on foot from his childhood home in North Florida. I'd asked him if the name had something to do with baseball, and he'd said no, like pitch dark. And then I'd said, as in Renata Adler, and he'd looked at me like I was hopeless. We went to the pitch once and walked around in there, back when my husband's father was dying, but not yet dead. And I'd wondered who was in charge of naming things, how such decisions were made. I was fond of my father-in-law and helped felt very sorry when he announced to us that he was dying and remained sorry even after he began to flood my voicemail with messages left in the middle of the night in the last month of his life. During this time, I had tried to engage my husband on the subject of his impending orphanhood, but he refused. Instead, he spent his free hours cultivating his rose garden, examining the teas for signs of distress and pruning his floribundas. He ordered expensive mulches online and frequented a nearby slaughterhouse for fresh manure. From the window of my backyard studio, I had observed him bending over the wide faces of the floribundas and whispering to them. Clearly, he regarded the roses as superior confidants. Yet I can't say that I was thinking about any of this when my husband showed me the photo. I was too busy looking at the boy in the background, small and white as milk and shimmying up a tree. Who's that? I asked my husband, pressing my thumb over the boy's head. We were standing in my studio just under a small skylight. All day I'd been at work on an illustration project commissioned by a wealthy eccentric. He snatched the photo for me. What do you mean who? That's me, the man you married. Not you, I said already exasperated. One unfortunate side effect of marriage was knowing the mistakes a person was going to make before they actually made them. I stood beside him and pointed at the boy in the tree. He held the photo close to his face. He blinked like he had something in his eye. Had he really not noticed the boy until this very moment? It was summer, which meant everyone walked around looking like they'd just been sprayed with a hose, and yet when I touched my husband's arm, his skin was cool and dry. I see what you're saying, he began to nod. I didn't before, but now I do. He explained that the boy was not a boy at all, but rather a large vine wrapped around the tree trunk, bleached and distorted by exposure. He pushed the photo under my nose. Whatever you say... I returned to my desk, pressed a pencil to my sketch pad. I could feel my husband hovering over me, could hear him saying my name, but I did not look up. Not if he was going to insist that I had mistaken a vine for a boy. That may have been the story he was intent on telling himself, but I wasn't about to let it infect me. I didn't yet understand that refusing one kind of narrative could activate another. You draw one line and then you draw another, I told myself until I heard the studio door open and close, felt the air settle. 
The next thing I knew it was dusk and I was standing by the window at a momentary loss for how to proceed with the next phase of my illustration project. And my husband was in the backyard with a grill lighter and a shovel. I watched him set the photograph on fire and then bury the ashes in the ground, a safe distance from the roses. After the incident with the photo, my husband's every movement adopted an aura of menace. I would look up from my desk and see his face pressed to the window of my studio or turn from the kitchen sink and find him right behind me in socked feet, perched on tiptoe like a gargoyle. He put his father's things on a shelf in the garage too high for me to reach, especially now that our ladder seemed to have gone missing. My husband worked as a receptionist for a psychiatrist, Dr. X, and began coming home late. From bed, I would hear the car rumble into the driveway, and once he was beside me, I would, somewhat against my will, fall into a sleep so deep it was like being absorbed into a black hole, though I couldn't say that I ever felt at rest. My husband continued to spend all his free time fussing over his roses. He started wearing his green gardening gloves indoors, leaving dirt trails on counters and side tables, charting his path through the house. When he was around, he pestered me with strange questions. Have you been checked for cataracts? He asked one morning, peeling an orange with his gloved hands. Have you ever suffered from psychodynamic visual hallucinations? He asked another. Is that something you heard from Dr. X? I said back. Do you even know what those words mean? My husband had always called his employer Dr. X, and I had joined him in his practice because in a marriage, few things were more powerful than shared habits. And then some years ago at the office holiday party, I learned that everyone called him Dr. X. Shorthand for a name, the doctor told me. He had grown tired of people mispronouncing. I don't understand what the big commotion is all about, I said to my husband in our kitchen. I saw what I saw, and I saw a boy in that tree. My husband had never been the kind of person who demanded that everyone agree with his version of things, but perhaps he was turning into one. I told myself that he had been terribly unsettled by his father's death, that grief, especially when it was not properly tended, could turn even a reasonable human being hostile and confused. Maybe he needed to make an appointment with Dr. X for himself instead of taking down the appointments of others. Surely there was an employee discount. I read up on double exposure and grief. I read up on spirit photography. I tried to understand why my husband would not or could not see the boy in the tree even after I had made his presence known. Had his not seeing been a charade or some kind of test? From the library, I checked out Chronicles of the Photographs of Spiritual Beings and Phenomena Invisible to the Material Eye. Yet nothing provided an explanation as satisfying as the one I knew to be true the moment I saw the photograph. My husband had done something to that boy in the tree. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Laura. Sarah, do you want me to read or do you want to go right to, um, or do you want to do questions with for Laura first? Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess if anyone has any um, specific questions for Laura, um, we'll take a couple and then, um, then you'll read. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds perfect. Yeah. Feel free to um, drop any questions you might have um, for Laura in the chat. Um, Randall is asking, is, is any of the story <laughs> based on your, or your life? Um, which I think is one of the pitfalls yeah. of reading a first person narrator. Um, yeah, it, it, it is. Um, I, I mean, I think something that I really love about the first person is that that sort of construction of voice and performance of voice. Um, and in some ways, 
it, it there yeah I think I'm a first person this sounds counterintuitive but often takes me farther away from myself than the third person does um so the story is not based on my life um the story takes uh, but uh but actually um the question is sort of apropos for this story because the impetus of the story came from a true thing so this this story is about a children's book illustrator and her husband, both of whom are kind of like low key deranged in their own ways. Um, and it's also a story about this like increasingly bizarre um, illustration commission that she's doing and like artistic ambition and, and all of these different things. And it's set um, in Florida, which of course is a landscape. That's where I am now, a landscape that I'm very familiar with. Um, but these characters, like out of all the characters in Wolf, these characters are probably like the furthest away from myself. Um, but the story came from this really odd moment where one of my older brothers showed me this photo of him in a forest in North Florida. And there was this strange kind of shape behind him. Like he was sort of in the bough of a tree and there was this kind of shape behind him. And I looked at the photo quickly and like I was not, I didn't have my reading glasses on. And for whatever reason, it was just a trick of the eye. Um, the shape looked like a person. It looked like another boy kind of perched behind him. And so I sort of opened it the way the wife does in this story. And I was like, who's that? And he was like, who's who? I was by myself. And then I was like, no, what is that? <clears throat> and we looked at it together and it really just was some kind of like funky um, it's very haunting actually when we looked at it closer because it was just exposure, um, but it looked like it almost had a sort of in the shape of a human silhouette. And so um, in that instance, you know, my brother's account was clearly the correct one, but I, um, yeah, I mean, I had been thinking about sort of what happens when people become so attached to a narrative, they lose any sense of like an objective reality, which certainly seems salient for our current times. And then that kind of more um, macro like idea or concern sort of merged with this very granular thing that happened and gave, gave way to the, um, that story. Thanks, Laura. A question from Timothy. On a related note for you, what goes into deciding whether to tell a story in first person, third person, et cetera? Um, thanks. Yeah, I think so. I, for me, I wish I had a really crafty answer for this, but I don't. I mean, for me, it's super intuitive and it just is sort of what I hear or what I experience when I'm writing um, an early draft. It's sort of, it's like the sentences are coming in an I or in a she. Um, and, and, and that's really how I sort of make those first person um, versus third person decisions most of the time. I do think that um, the kind of grace of third person is that you can see into a character, but you can also see around the character. Um, so it's a more, it's naturally like a more multidimensional perspective. And I think there's some stories that really require that roundness. Um, and, and there's some stories where I think that that like performance of voice and kind of construction of voice and, and identity and reality that, that is, happens in a specific way in the first person is, is also really important. Um, the, by the time you get to the end of the story, sort of where we land is, you know, this um, narrator giving this account of this like incredibly bizarre and disturbing thing that happens to her and her husband. And it's sort of like, do you believe her or not? Um, and I think that the, the impact of that instability has a, a particular effect um, in the first person that would sort of like be diminished in the third person. So certainly in the revision phase, I do like press on those choices and think about like, what is the third person opening up here? What is the first person opening up here? But, um, but at least initially it's super intuitive and it's not something that I really think about in a super conscious way. Thanks, Laura. Um, one more question, and then we'll, um, we'll have Nina read. Um, Hi, Laura, such an amazing story. I noticed a motif throughout of nature connecting to a sense of grief or loss, rose bushes, forest. Is there an intentional connection to nature in these um, tones within the story? Mm. Yeah, I think um, 
I mean, like, that's also something that I probably, you know, I, I think like our most powerful work comes from the more subterranean parts of the imagination and like not the part of my brain that um, I use to like make a grocery list uh, or, or, feed, or feed the dog, right? And so I'm sure that th there is like a part of the mind that is creating those motifs, but it's not necessarily a part of the mind that I'm super conscious of while I'm working. Um, I certainly might become more conscious in, in revision, but I think I'm um, someone, you know, if I sat down and said like, I will make a motif with nature, like I would never write anything again. Um, but I, I do think, you know, that it's in, in, when writing work that's set in Florida, it feels very natural and intuitive for me for, for nature and the kind of force of place to be really like omnipresent because um, for those of you, yeah, who have lived in, have experience with this state or with any environments that are similar, it's just like nature is omnipresent. You know, it's always bearing down on us. Um, I mean, this it's been interesting to be here, you know, with my husband who's um, from New England. And it's just like in the summer, it's like we had like ants coming in through the doorways and we had like lizards that we would have to catch and then put back <laughs> outside. And, you know, they're like alligators lurking around in various bodies of water and, um, you know, like snakes on, you know, crossing the sidewalks. I and mean, it's this sort of like, just a general vibe of pestilence, especially in the warmer months. So it's like you're, you're constantly in negotiation with nature um, and nature can feel like, I think a very encroaching force here. Like in the, like if you don't mow your lawn for like a month in the summer, um, you would have like, you would ha need like a machete. Um, it's just like, like stuff like grows really quickly. And there's that, there's that sense of, yeah, of nature being like a real kind of a real um, force. Thanks, Laura. Um, Nina, will you will you read for us, yeah. and then we'll um, bring everyone together. That sounds great. Um, now I'm really conscious because I have a first person narrator. <laughs> um, so I am going to read from my novel. Um, I have been working on this novel for years. <laughs> I um, One thing, Laura and I are good friends, and it's it's always the one thing I really appreciate about Laura is she's just so prolific comparatively I'm so slow um I've been sort of achingly writing a novel for for a long time and um I think I, I definitely have a draft I think it's coming to a to an end um I hope I would write it like it to be out of my life soon um but I I thought I would read from um actually chapter two so I think the only setup you need to know um to sort of set up the novel is it the novel follows two it's it's told in retrospection but it's it's about two teenage girls that that commit a murder and um they they kill their uncle and um so it's not a whodunit at all but um you definitely are trying to piece together what happened within this family that they would do that um and uh the two girls names are agatha krishna and georgie um Iyer. their last name is Iyer, um based on the two british um female novelists georgette Heyer and um agatha christie of course so um just because their names are a little jolting i'll i won't set that, their names up um and i don't think you need to know much else the um the uncle and aunt and two cousins have come from india and they're living in the house with with the other with the family um, with the girls and, and her parents. And um, again, this is the narrator looking back. So this starts, um, this starts with the second chapter. It was by accident that I saw that Cottonwood Cross was for sale. Brianna Salk was an acquaintance, someone I knew from high school, but as an adult, I could not conjure her face. Her name brought to mind several girls I had gone to school with, all white, all with bangs curled and sprayed like rising waves on their forehead foreheads all with oversized all with oversized jean jacket and esprit bags bulging with books the house was listed in her facebook feed while i was scrolling through recipes and political rants i saw not the logo of her employer home hunter realtors but the familiar group of trees that framed the perimeter of the house and peeking out through the leaves the brick facade of the porch the yard was long and unkempt and a pine tree that used to be near the gate was gone the house originally had no name. It was my mother who had named it Cottonwood Cross, who began its recorded history. The house had had two owners before us, another oil worker, and then an insurance agent. 
My sister and I found a box of free notepads with his logo emblazoned on them. We used them over the years, never knowing Eugene Johnson and how, his, how he could fix your insurance needs. We lived in a kind of cul-de-sac and all the houses were ranch houses. They had a squat, cowering look to them. The only thing that marked height were the cottonwoods that ringed each of the lawns. At the corner of the cul-de-sac was the largest cottonwood tree. Angel Moore, um, it's a neighbor girl, who did not live on the street but seemed to always be at her aunt's house, told us early that they had hung Indians from that tree, back when the land was a cattle ranch. Months later, right before we killed my uncle, all the children, neighborhood children spent the summer playing hangings. We hanged my cousins off most, and most of the Mitchell children with a clothesline regularly off a low branch. Agatha Krishna had been the one to kick out the stool from under them. I think she wanted to practice killing, to see if we had the grit, and already I balked. I hung back while she and Angel paraded whoever went to our noose, all their crimes recorded on a Eugene Johnson notepad. Nick gr grinned like an idiot. He wore a hat fashioned out of peacock feathers we had stolen. Of course, the rope was long and there was no actual hanging, but I knew by Angel and Agatha Krishna's expression that they had not an edge of remorse. Angel recited the Lord's Prayer and then spoke in tongues, which she had learned when her family had lived in a Missouri Bible camp, which my mother said was a cult. Months before her whole family had come back limply next door to her aunts, I knew she was back when I heard the shrill call of gibberish intermixed with the sound of chickadees. Chickadee zee zee, the birds would sing first thing. Deo, Mabatford, Ojipi, Cadillaca, Angel would call out from the lawn. Good morning, says the mountain chickadee at the beginning of the day. Hello, Lord, is what Angel said in the beginning. It is morning, but still dark. In the beginning, there is birdsong in the black air. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. But before light, there is birdsong. In the beginning was heaven and earth. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the God and word was with God and the word was God. When Angel spoke like that, I listened. But Agatha Krishna was the one who laughed, who told Angel to stop, to know, she, to say to tell her that she didn't know any other language. And it was true. When we would implore Angel to speak in her heavenly language, she sometimes balked and began listing car names, but added an A or an O to make it sound like something else. Chevroletta, Fordo, Oldsmobile. We didn't have the heart to challenge her. Nick and Ryan said little around any of us. Nick and Ryan are the two, the uncle's sons. We were older and they followed wherever we would go. They played whatever games we suggested. In my mind, I think there are two Independence Days that made our family. The first was on August 15th, 1947, when India became the new and India, not jewel in the crown India, India without a king or a maharaja or a viceroy, but a new India, a shining democracy. The second day was when we killed my uncle, also in August in 1986. On the day my uncle died, only one other person in the, one other person in the state of Wyoming was also killed. Her name was Lilith Jones. The circumstances of their deaths were incredibly different. Benod Iyer died at 1.20 a.m. after a brief illness, while Lilith Jones died in a tragic accident in which she was hit by an oncoming car at 3.14 p.m. in the afternoon. My uncle Vinny died at home. He had been vomiting and feeling ill on and off for two weeks. Lilith Jones was killed on the side of U.S. Highway 287. She had stopped her car to look at a herd of antelope. Miss Jones was not from Wyoming, but from Michigan. She was visiting relatives in Casper and had decided to take minor roads rather than the I-25 from Denver. Antelope were new to her. She had seen deer galore, but, quote, antelope were a creature of God she had not witnessed, the newspaper quoted the next day from a cousin in Louisville, Kentucky. She pulled her Honda CRX over to the side of the road and got out to take a look. Later, the driver of the, other, of the truck that hit her would state that she was not at the side of the road or even near the vehicle. He would state that she was in the middle of the road, like a prairie dog. She stood still, fixed as he approached. He came upon her soon after a curve in the road, and he admits he was flipping a tape in the tape deck. He hit her at 55 miles an hour. Her body flew onto the shoulder and onto the prairie, and the antelope ran in a loping gait towards a fence, a nearby snow fence. The driver, a 67-year-old man named Darren Parks, cried on the TV news when he recounted the story. He didn't see her. He was so sorry. Agatha Christian and I love the story of Lilith Jones. For one thing, her death was far more spectacular than Vinod Iyer. His death was only mentioned in the obituaries of the local paper, and as per my Aunt Debbie's request, no autopsy was done. My uncle, who drank heavily and smoked over a pack of day, was not seen as a suspicious death. Although he was young, he lived hard, especially since he had moved to America. In the weeks leading up to his death, he had gone to a Black Sabbath concert, 
a move that had made my mother sullen for days. Satanic panic was in full force, and my mother thought the band was not godly. He partied at the county fair, an event my mother also did not allow us to go to, as she thought it was teeming with kidnap kidnappers and perverts. Later in junior high, I would join 4-H partly because I wanted to belong, but more because I wanted to be able to go to the fair, and my mother had to comply with seeing the limp dresses and skirts I made on display, my gem-like jars of crabapple jelly with ribbons around their neck. But wait, we have to go back, back to the almost new India. Leading up to that first independence, my grandmother became nervous. Madras was far away from Lahore and the new line which moved across the scalp of India, jutting like a snout in what to, in, into what would become Pakistan. But even in Madras, there was unrest. Hindus and Muslims eyed each other with a sly so die, so, side eye. The Nizam of Hyderabad wanted to join Pakistan, but it wasn't viable. It was just too far to move, and with them stuck in the south, so they watched the head of the country rip in two. When rioting started across the partition line, only small waves were felt in Madras. Trifling disputes broke out in sputters and markets and in front of train stations. And so my grandmother, ever practical, bought cheap wooden rosaries made out of the seed of lotuses, or was it aloe? My mother, when later telling us about them, couldn't remember what they were made of. But my uncle even then was sly. He chewed on the rosary as a snack and told my mother if they planted the beads, a tree would grow. My grandmother put the rosaries around their neck each morning in the days leading up to August 15th and well after. If anyone stops you, if anyone says anything to you, just start saying the Our Father. And thus began weeks of beggars and shopkeepers alike being given bits of prayer rather than any response. One pesa asked one unsuspecting beggar and was met with a fervored, hallowed be thy name. When ordering a tutti frutti, the candy man's long look was met with, give us our daily bread, and he brought my mother a spongy piece of white bread, clean and flat with her shake. It was a tactic that Agatha Christian and I used later when not wanting to answer any questions. We used the Hail Mary instead, and when asked by teachers or even my mother about why we were sullen or why we didn't want to do something, our rote response was, blessed be the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. My mother's school was called Dufton after the captain John Dufton, who was like us, mixed, an Anglo-Indian who played some role in a British campaign in Afghanistan or India, and later bequeathed 50,000 pounds for the purpose of education, which led to the formation of a school and a college in Calcutta. My uncle, who from a young age showed no aptitude, aptitude to school, went instead to a local Indian school, but spent much, much of his time wandering the streets of Kilpak, playing cards and roughhousing with older boys. On August 15, 1947, all the girls in the school gathered around the flagpole. My mother tucked her rosary into her white starched uniform. All the girls sang God Save the King one last time, and then the Union Jack came down. The new orange, white, and green with the blue Ashoka wheel went up. And then they worked their way through Jana Ganamana. As most of them were Tamil or Anglo-Indian, they struggled with the lyrics as the Indian flag was hoisted up the pole. Jai hey, jai hey, jai hey, they repeated again and again. The Bengali Sanskrit words turned in their Tamil mouth like those rosary beads, bitter and unpalatable. That afternoon when she and her sister came home, their rosaries swinging like nooses around their neck, they found my grandfather Thomas Iyer sitting at the table. My great-grandfather was an inspector at a match factory and lived in Kerala. He traveled up that day for what he felt was not the beginning of a new India, but the beginning of a new chapter for the Iyers. Two books sat in the center of the table. Today, you're going to learn a new language. India began today. We are unified. Thomas spoke in, in English, but switched back into Tamil to address my grandmother. Now, what do you suppose the language of the new India is? My uncle, perhaps expecting the trip, trick, replied, Hindi? No. It couldn't have been Tamil. English, my mother chimed in? No. Sanskrit, my uncle Vinny shouted and added a jaya hey just to suck up. Nay, Thomas reached for the book and opened the first one. Basic Esperanto was typed in bold lettered on the first page. Salutan, he replied. Your mother and your father, your brother, we're all going to learn the language of the future. Look at India, all muddled. Do we speak Hindi? Do we speak Tamil? Do we speak English? I say we need a new language, a language of the world, a language that unites us. From here on, we will speak the language in which the world will be speaking 10 years, 100 years from now. Kilvil Sanas, he asked to the mute faces of my mother and her father. When my mother told us that story to us later, and for how years Thomas only spoke Esperanto to the silence of his children and grandchildren, it delighted us. We looked in the library about learning Esperanto and then gave up. We need to make our own language, Georgie. I've started a, li a list. Yakaduk is when something is really bad. Helidi is when something's really good. A Udalup is a stupid person, said Agatha Krishna. 
We never got beyond these three words, but strangely, they served us well for many years. A quick yuck-a-duck or yudalup said more to, between us than much else. Poor great-grandfather Thomas. His dream of uniting India with Esperanto never came to fruition. Instead, he had pen pals in Poland and France, to which he wrote long letters in Esperanto. The name Esperanto means one who hopes, and that summed up Thomas very well indeed. Uno ligivo nimi esta suficia. One language is never enough, he wrote. Mi felicitas, I'm happy, he wrote. Gisa revido, he signed off every letter. I'm going to end that there. Thanks so much, Nina. Um, if anyone, does anyone have any particular questions just for Nina on her project or um, her, um, her first book? Feel free to drop them into the chat. How long have you been working on your novel, Nina? Um, yeah, um, I've been working on it, you know, on and off since my, since I finished the story collection, a lot of like life stuff has happened. And so I, um, I, I, I'm definitely not an everyday writer. So um, I would go pretty long stretches without writing on it. But I, I think I start, started some version, I wrote a whole third person version of the novel. And I started that probably in 2011. So yeah, it's been a long time. And then but I definitely have put the novel aside for you know i had a year i didn't work on it at all um so pretty long pretty long stretches <laughs> um hillary says wonderful readings from both nina and laura thank you so much sasha says wow thank you nina how do you know when you are finished with a project do you do you usually know um you know i haven't had <laughs> i haven't Again, I, I'm not the most prolific writer. So um, I, I think even with this novel right now, I might need someone to take it away from me um, because I don't think I'll ever feel like I'm finished or that I, I, I have found a stopping place. I always think I need something more. I think it was easier with a short story. It felt like maybe because I was turning some of them in for, for classes and workshops. Um, but this has felt a lot more unwieldy. But, you know, I think... I think for me, I, it'll get to the point where I just genuinely can't think of anything else to do to fix it. And I think, I think that's when I maybe need to turn it over um, to another reader or someone else. I don't know about you, Laura. Is that the same for you? How do you know when you're done? I agree that it's much harder with novels. Um, I wonder if it's, I mean, maybe like we I think it would be safe to say that like we've both written more short stories than novels. Do you know what I mean? And like, so it's just that it's like you have more experience. Um, I had a, a the, I read an interview once with a writer, Catherine Lacey, and she was talking about, and the interviewer had asked her that about that question of finishedness. And she's like, it's like, um, it's, she thinks of it as like making a sauce, you know, and the more <laughs> sauces you make, the more you can just kind of taste it and know um, and and you could sort of say like, oh, it needs to be thicker or it needs more salt. And then when it tastes done, it just does, right? It would be hard to quantify that exactly um, to an outside person, but it just sort of tastes like how it's supposed to taste. But I, I think the thing, you know, about that analogy is that like the more sauces you make, the more you develop that palate. And I think that that's, you know, we have like, to bring it back to fiction, it's like we, we have made more, more short story sauces <laughs> and novel sauces. Yeah, I think it's hard with the novel. I mean, I think the other thing with the story, and certainly like I benefit hugely from readerly input on my stories and like my, I, we are um, yes, <coughs> blessed to have the same wonderful agent and like um, agents, you know, reading and, and input. But I... I, yeah, I mean, I think there's also something like you can just kind of take in the whole thing. Yeah. And I think that that it, it's, it's makes it a little bit easier to kind of get a handle on like how the, the sort of piece is working together or not as a collective, where I think as a novel, it's like that we're like, we're standing so close, you know, we're in the eye of the storm and it can be really difficult to sort of step away and get that more bird's eye view of how the book is working. I mean, I sort of, I'll be like, there's this chapter that I'm not sure about and there's this chapter that I really love. And every time they read it, I get super excited. And I think the end is like off, but 
you know, but it's like it, but yeah, we need someone to kind of take in the whole thing and sort of give us feedback from that perspective, I think. Yeah. Um, I, there's a question from um, Carrie Marr in the chat for Nina. And Carrie is asking, with this project for Nina, with this project, you said that it's not a who done it, but more of a why did they do it? In your own writing process, did you know from the beginning why the girls killed their uncle, or, or was it also a discovery for you? And how much do you generally know about your characters as you enter a project? I think that last last question might be um, good for both of you. Like, how much do you know about your characters before, um, before or during <laughs> um, your projects? Um, I did know why they killed him from the get-go. So for me, it was um, it was more just, um, you know, I, again, I, I wrote a, th a first version that was, um, it was told by three girls. It was told by Georgie would tell one chapter. Um, well, it was, it was third person, but it would be, it was Georgie, Agatha Krishna, and then the neighbor girl, Angel. And so it was three different narrators. And then at a certain point, I actually had a lot of trouble differentiating their voices. I, it's like three teenage girls. It's like, ugh, especially the sisters, I felt like I, even I felt like they were, I would sometimes be confused as to who was talking. And so I ended up scratching that and just making it from George, just changing it to first person and making it Georgie. But um, so I think it was discovery in that I, I feel like for me, I realized I didn't need three girls to tell the story um, as painful as it was to take the other two girls out and make them more on the, in the background. Um, and I think, so I definitely discovered that I really wanted it to be her story. And then, you know, in the beginning, I was the very, again, this was the early draft of this novel. Um, I was really obsessed with one day novels. They're called circadian novels. Um, so a novel like, um, Ulysses or Mrs. Dalloway or um, Saturday by Ian McEwen. Like I really wanted to make a one day. I just wanted it the day they killed an uncle. And um, that is really hard. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it's really, really hard. And I think you don't have much discovery about your characters, especially teenage girls in the course of a, maybe if they were adults, it would be a different day. But um, I just didn't feel like they could have the retrospect to like look, I, I don't know, at the end of a day, you're not going to really think back too much so I, I I really scratched that idea but I was really obsessed with the compression of a one-day novel um, maybe because I was coming to it from short stories so um, again I, I had so many false starts so I do feel like I know these characters really well at this point because um, I have taken them on many different trips around the this uh, 1986 yeah, I, that's fascinating. Thanks for sharing that process because I feel like it's so important for um, working writers to understand that it takes a lot of different attempts to get to the structure or the voice or the speaker that you want um, to help carry the whole project. Um, yeah, and just because you like a form doesn't mean you can write it. Like I love one day novels. I spent like months reading them and different ones. And then I was like, yeah, actually I can't do this. So um you know, not yet anyway. Laura, do you, Laura, do you generally know um, your, your characters as you enter the project? I'm guessing it's more of an intuitive feel for you. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what Nina was speaking to really resonates with me and that, I mean, it sounds like Nina, you, it's like you were saying like you've, you you feel like you know your characters really well at this point because you've taken them on so many journeys and I think yeah I mean I think that that that's how it is for me too I mean that the they're they're I feel like I I mean I think in a in a basic way I know very little um when I begin a a project. I might know more beginning a novel project, but know very little about, um, uh, certainly when I begin a short story, like I might have like a general idea, like, um, you know, I, you know, that this, there was this sort of spark that went off when I had this conversation with my brother about the photograph, but that's, you know, it's just that, that kind of just enough to sort of yeah. find a point of entry into the story. And then the discovery really happens along the way. And I do think with novels too, because there's just, there are more dimensions and more considerations. Yeah, many false starts, many wrong turns, many moments where I'm like absolutely sure that I have totally and completely cracked it, um, only to realize, you know, a month later that I've gone 100% in the wrong 
um, direction. And, and, and it's, it's a lot of like trial and error, trial and error. I mean, I think the, that the sort of Beckettian approach of like fail, fail again, fail better, um, feels very, very apt for, for novels. Um, Amy Lynn from the chat. Hi, Amy. Um, asks Nina and Laura in terms of pacing a novel, how do you navigate what is the appropriate or best pacing for the novel? What decisions go into that shaping of a novel's pace or rate of reveal? Laura, you've actually uh, published novels, so I feel like you yeah, should. Yeah, I can to start. start. With. <laughs> well, I thought that was, I was actually thinking, you know, like listening to the amazing excerpt you read, like just like how beautifully calibrated the pacing is and how much like breadth you're able to cover in a relatively short, a short excerpt. Ex, uh, excerpt. Um, you know, I think Amy, hi, Amy. Um, thanks for being here. I think that, I mean, again, I think I, I just, I, I, it's a, it's, I wish I had a more precise and sort of craftier answer, but this is kind of like point of view to me where I think it's just a massive amount of trial and error. Um, I think that one thing that I've learned is that things happening quickly in a novel do not necessarily equal um, a more urgent um, or momentum filled pacing and things conversely happening slowly in a novel also don't mean that you necessarily have a sort of sluggish pacing. I think when I was first making the leap from the, the smaller scale of the short story, the larger scale to the novel, I just had this idea. I'm like, okay, it's a novel. It's much longer. I had this idea that just like a lot of stuff needed to happen. And so in early drafts, I would just, there would be this sort of stacking of events um, and kind of one thing happening after another, after another. Um, and I was amazed when I gave it to early readers and they were like, actually this read, this read is like kind of slow. <laughs> and sort of tedious and I was like but how could that be there's so much happening like people are you know getting off to left and right they're like car you know proverbial like car chases and unicorns etc um but I think you know just like in a story though if we but if we can extrapolate it out to a larger scale that that you know causal chain of action that link between one thing and another still is so important um and and the the way things kind of build on each other in a novel is so important um and and i i think that was a real sort of lesson for me you know that it's it's never about just adding 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 event does not make something inherently more urgent um i actually don't think events matter in fiction which might sound really bizarre um but if you think about it like they kind of don't. I mean, that this is why I, I once had, re I'll never forget this. I read two short stories, once back to back from undergraduate students. And one was about a character getting lost in a um, national forest, which was based on an experience that uh, actually happened to her. She was like lost in the woods in Oregon for three entire days um, by herself. She was like 16, was left behind by a school group. And the other one was about a, a character who fails her driving test. Um, if I, th those very concise plot summaries would suggest that probably we would think that the Lost in the Forest story would be the most sort of urgent and suspenseful. And it was the opposite, actually. Um, the failed driving test story was like riveting. Um, and and the, the Lost in the Forest story was super boring. And that, it was actually that experience teaching that totally, I was like, I don't, do events not matter? I, maybe they don't. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's so much about what does it mean to the character? What does it mean to the world? What is this sort of mark that these events have left on characters or how have left on the world? What is sort of irrevocably altered by them? And that's what makes event matter. Um, and I think that that sort of revelation of meaning is really sort of what we're talking about when we talk about pacing. And so that's something I probably can't get my head around that in early drafts, but certainly in later drafts, that's something that I would think about quite a bit. 
Yeah. And I mean, I'm still struggling with that, to be honest, because I didn't write the novel chronologically. I think that, w- which is why I think right now the revision has been so rough. Um, I wrote parts I knew I wanted to write. I had a short story that was in my, um, it was in my MFA thesis. Um, it was slightly not enjoyed in my MFA thesis, I'll say that. And um, later it was not in Cowboys. And it was a story that I always really liked. And um, it was based on a Eudora Welty story that I really loved, Moon Lake. Um, and it was about a group of girls at this, at this Girl Scout camp. And I, um, I just knew somewhere I would use this story. And I think maybe that, that was actually the first bit I wrote of the novel was actually in the middle about these girls in a, in a Girl Scout camp. And I, I, you know, I was thinking about what it means to be a young girl. And then, you know, so I definitely took incidents and because my stuff is sort of, this novel is somewhat autobiographical, though I have not killed anyone um, or murdered anyone, um, not to my knowledge anyway. Um, I, I, I just wanted to, I, I guess I did write out certain scenes because they were very strong to me to begin with, but I will say in shaping the book, um, Mira Jacob, the writer, um, she, Mira had shown me a picture of how she storyboards um, her book. She storyboarded her storyboarded her first novel, and um, I she had all these color po- colored post it notes on the wall of different scenes and some of the pacing. And I I used I ended up having as time went on, I really needed to tighten up the structure of the book, and so it's definitely <laughs> I've used that method of sort of sort of sorry sort of storyboarding sorry um i have a newborn so i'm tired <laughs> um i'm always i'm losing my train of thought as i speak um i storyboarded and i also bought a book on screenwriting called save the cat which my friend um who did her mfa at the university of um at at the michener center they had she had taken a screenwriting class and she said that that really had helped her with pacing in her novel and i actually found that while I don't think a lot of the methods of screenwriting work for a novel, I do think it was, it was helpful to me to sort of see how a screenwriter would approach it. And, um, and it helped me pull out, it helped me be able to cut certain things that I think weren't adding to the pace for sure. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Nina. Um, Nancy is wondering from both of you, which writers have influenced your writing the most, both positively and negatively. Um, And then I just want to say that we'll take um, there. I think there's a couple more questions and then maybe like one or two more questions um, before we wrap up tonight. So there's any really burning question that you must ask before tonight is over or else your life will have been, we will be over. Please drop it into the chat. Um, So again, um, the question from Nancy is, um, are there writers that have influenced your writing the most? Who are they um, possibly and um, maybe positively and negatively? Um. Um, I can start that one. Uh, gosh, I don't know if anyone I can think of someone who's been like a negative influence. I mean, so many writers have influenced my work in a really like joyful way. I mean, I can, yeah, I'm just having like a stampede of names in my head right now. But I think um, a couple are for sure the writer Joy Williams, who I think is like one of our um, living greats and um, and her and she's just a total original like no one. Um, no one writes like her, no one has her sort of sensibility exactly. And I, I love her work for its distinctiveness and its daring. Um, she never kind of does the easy thing on the page, I think. Um, and I really, um, the writer um, Yoko Tawada has been super important for me, particularly her novel, like The Naked Eye was one of those books that made me really understand fiction in a different way. Um, in the short story space, um, I love both Edward P. Jones and Yin Lee. I think that they're both, they have a classical sensibility and also are like, wildly experimental in their way and they always remind me of like how capacious sort of world and time can be in the context of the short story so um i will i'll stop there yeah i mean for me um i mean there's so many i mean i i like laura i think i just think every writer has a huge list of people that really mean a lot to them as a writer um i i think for me i had a real revelation 
in college when I, I, I had really never read any other Indian writers until I got to college. Um, my um, undergrad was, or my um, high school experience was really canonical and which I love a lot of those writers. I don't get me wrong. Um, and even in college, I really hadn't um, read any writers of color really um, hugely. I mean, I know it's very different now, but it was the nineties. And um, the first time I ever read one of Chitra Deva Karuni's books, um, her short story collection, Arranged Marriage, it really, I was like, wait a minute, that's, I see myself on the page, which I hadn't really done. That really hadn't happened before for me. Um, so, you know, her, her book, uh, Arranged Marriage, and I even, you know, Jambula Harry, they have been, they were been huge. Um, and Borthy Murkaji, I would say those three women really influenced a lot of my early stories. I knew I wanted to write stories because they all wrote stories. Um, I think later, I mean, the writers I loved when I was younger were definitely writers that wrote about the West. I, I loved, you know, Willa Cather and, and Laura Ingalls Wilder and people that wrote about this place that I also was from was, was really important to me. And, um, I would say for this last novel, um, Laura is really lucky to work with her at Harvard um, for this book. Um, Claire Massoud's The Woman Upstairs has meant a great deal to me because she had a first person. She had a novel that I loved with a first person narrator that wasn't hugely likable. And I, I think I, that novel felt to me like um, she created a, a first person, a woman narrator that I just really, really loved. So um, I love her writing as well. And, um, and, and, and also this book has become as I, as I've had other drafts has become a lot more experimental. i my story collection was pretty traditional in the way I was storytelling. This st book has a lot of weirder sections and um, parts of the book are told in second person. And then, and I think it's also been really wonderful to read people like Jenny Offal and, and people, I don't know how I'm pronouncing it right, Offal, um, who, who are just kind of doing different things with form and, and Laura is actually a big influence on me, to be honest, too, as well. Uh, Laura's and her friendship and her reading has really, um, I don't know, this has really been important to me as a writer as well. Thank you. Um, one last question, um, and it's about publication. Um, and then I know that you both have had different paths to publishing short story collections. Um, someone is wondering um, if it's harder to publish a collection, especially before you've um, published a novel. And um, Misty was wondering about your experiences. And I just want to preface this that I know that there's no one path, one way um, to publication. And that from my experience in talking to writers about this particular question of publication, um, I always hear a different answer from every single person. Um, and if you're in this room and you have a book that you're working on or a project that you're looking for a home for it, um, I hope that you maintain your hope and your dream and you keep trying because from what I'm understanding about this process is that there's no direct way ever. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing Nina and Laura's um, experiences but um, with that caveat also is that, it, you know, it's part, partially luck and, um, and yeah, you're writing too, yeah, you know. Yeah. Anyway. I can go first because I just have the one book. Um, so I only have the one experience. Um, I, Laura and I share an agent. We both have Catherine uh, Fawcett as our agent and she's amazing. Um, and I had met her at a, at a, at a writing conference, um, at Breadloaf Writers Conference. Um, and, um, you know, she submitted my collection to all the big houses. It was the nicest round of rejections you possibly could get. They all ended with, I wish she had a novel. <laughs> um, it was a really painful experience. Um, and, it, you know, the, the houses kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller as time went on. And um, I, I didn't have a novel. I didn't even have an idea for a novel at the time. So um, I felt like I had put everything into the story collection. Um, and eventually a really small press called Five Chapters took took the book. Um, it was, you know, a one man operation. So it was a, it was a very, um, he had published this, this journal, um, five chapters, which was a great journal that had a lot of amazing short story writers in it. Um, he was a, Dave Daly is a real proponent of the short story. And yeah, so it was published with a, with a very small press. Um, and, you know, I did a lot of the legwork myself for that book. Um, I, I, 
took my own savings and, you know, made my own press pack, uh, like printed out my own postcards and made my own press. I had worked at a publishing house before, so I knew how to make a press release. And I, I really, you know, contacted all, I knew I wasn't going to get reviewed because there weren't advanced reader copies. And I, you know, I contacted every friend I knew and asked them to, if I could be on their blog or their, their anything. And, you know, just, it was really word of mouth until I won pen, um, which was an amazing experience and really changed the trajectory of the book. But um, again, it was pretty, it was pretty small, um, pretty small operation and, and um, was a lot of work on my end to, to get that book out into the world, which I was happy to do. Cause it's like, you know, it's your baby. You want people to think your baby's cute. So I was, yeah. I was willing to hustle for it. So that was my path. Yeah. I, I mean, my path for my first collection was very similar to, to Nina's um, in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, certainly the sort of like, public, like I, I Dizink, um books published my first collection and they were slightly bigger, but it was like a two man operation instead of a one man operation. They've since grown quite a bit, but at that time, were um, were quite small. Um, we ended up in, in a kind of a slightly odd situation where I had won um, a contest uh, or so, sort of a, an award that they were doing at that time. And it didn't formally come with an offer of publication, but they did shortly thereafter offer to publish the collection. So we had like a very narrow window to go out to other places. And so we did like one, you know, round um, to, like really big houses. I had very similar experiences as Nina, where it was like really nice rejection. And it was like, we, you know, stories are hard, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we kind of were in the spot of like, do we like turn down to Zane's author and keep shopping? And for various reasons, we decided to not do that and to, and to publish with them. Um, and in my subsequent two uh, book deals after that, it was a story collection and a novel together. Um, I will say that of several years ago, I taught a class on um, this uh, putting together story collections and we touched on publishing at the end. And in preparation for that, I just emailed my editor at FSG and like straight asked her, could you have bought the, my second story collection, The Isle of Youth, if there was not a novel attached? And because I, I knew students were gonna ask me that and I wanted to be able to give them an honest answer and ultimately I'm not a publishing professional, professional so I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, and she said, yes, she would have been able to. Um, and that she actually, in fact, at FSG has bought a number of um, story collections without a novel attached to them. But she said the advance would have been lower because the majority of the advance, if you're looking at the contract, is allocated toward the novel. Um, so I think, I think it's difficult to sell a story collection for like a lot of money. Um, uh, without a novel attached, so that's you know something something to be something to be aware of. But uh, but you know I think one thing that can get a little bit lost in this conversation by sort of pitting novel versus story collection together is that it's really hard to sell a book. Period. Um, it's really hard to sell a novel. Um, I know many many writers. I'm sure other people in this room know many many writers who have unsold novels, unsold memoirs, etc. Um, I don't say that to discourage like anyone um but it it just it's a it's a it's a there's a lot of rejection in any kind of creative practice um and and it and it can and i'm here to tell you that it like it continues too so publishing books does not um you know elevate you to the sphere where you have no more rejection you just yeah i mean i it's 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 a it's sort of it's like death taxes and getting stuff rejected um are, are, are you know a few of the the constants we can count on so I think it's it's important to be aware of it's my dog just agreeing with me. Um, I think it's important to be aware of like the legitimate challenges of going out with a story collection individually um, in terms of like it will pro probably aff affect the advance um, that's offered. Um, some editors might say hi, Lincoln. Some editors might say that you know I'd love to buy this if only there was a novel attached, but. Um, but don't, I would say like, don't let that stop you necessarily. They're absolutely writers um, who sell individual story collections, who only write stories, who have ever, who've only ever written stories. Um, and there are editors who buy and publish individual story collections. Um, I think the, like the kind of 
the thing that we can get a little bit stuck in is like, oh, would it be easier if I had a novel attached or, oh, would it be easier if I went out with a novel first? And the truth is like, it's all really hard, um, but it's also all really possible. Um, and, you know, like my husband, Paul Yoon, who's a writer, I mean, he was, had several books rejected before he published um, his first book. And so, yeah, I mean, there's so much possibility out there, but we, and we just have to like, and we just have to keep going. Um, but I think the more we can kind of direct our energy on like our project and forward movement, thoughtful forward movement, um, the better it is for us as human beings and the better it is for like our work ultimately. Um, so if you want to write stories, yeah, and you, you are not sure you ever want to write a novel, like, you know, yeah, it will be like, feel like an uphill battle um, at, at times, like, of course, but writing and publishing is an uphill battle, period. So the shape of your hill might just be a little bit different, but I, but keep climbing it, says I. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Thank you, Nina. Um, I just wanted to take every, a moment for everyone to unmute and to give a round of applause to our authors for reading um, tonight. I'm going to switch to gallery view. So, yeah, everyone on mute, please give our authors a round of applause. 